All right. All right. Well, once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, this afternoon. My name is Daniel Del Pielago. I work with Empower DC. We are a grassroots organizing group that works around the city. One of our primary campaigns is improving and holding on to public housing. I'm glad that I see some familiar names here. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are a membership organization. Um, and we'd love to um, support you all in the work that you're 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 doing. And we're having tonight's training because we feel it's a real important topic for public housing residents to be aware of. Um, I'm going to uh, say hello to Lori Leibowitz, who will be helping us um, break down uh, not only the the most the, the things that we feel are really concerning and that public housing residents should know but also how this process has just not been very great. So welcome, Lori. Hello, great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So before we start, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, let me share here the proposed agenda for tonight. Um, doo -dee -doo -dee -doo. Give me one second. Pardon that, that's my family. Okay, so we've done the welcomes and the introductions. Um, if you can, if you would please put your name and property in the chat. We just wanna know who's here. As I mentioned, I know a couple of y'all, but I'd love to know uh, who's here and what your property is. If you could do that at the chat at some point, that would be great. We always like to remind folks of just some general ground rules so we can have a productive meeting. Of course, as I mentioned, the meeting is recorded. Uh, we do share it as a resource to other residents who were not able to make it today. Please stay on mute if possible. Um, please wait to be recognized to speak. We will have a question and answer portion. Uh, so, and if you have any burning questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and in general, let's just respect one another uh, in the meeting. Um, so with that said, um, I'll just give a little background as to what, um, why we're here today. Um, so as many of you all remember, this past year, HUD did a an evaluation and investigation into the Housing Authority. It came back with a pretty serious report that the housing authority was um, not doing quite a bit of what it's supposed to do. As a response, the housing authority has updated what is known. Well, one of the things that they've done, and we don't have enough time during this meeting to talk about all those things, but we're going to focus on how the housing authority has updated its ACOP plan, ACOP which stands for their um, Admissions and Continued Occup Occupancy Plan, which is essentially the guiding policy that allows people into public housing and then the guiding policy that people need to abide by that live in public housing. We noticed a lot of alarming updates, uh, which you've seen in the flyer that we've been passing out uh, recently at your respective properties. Uh, so tonight we wanted to just go a little deeper into that, some of the concerns around the process, and then what does this all mean for the future, right? And what can we do um, to be better prepared? Because unfortunately, part of the result of this is if you are not following some of these uh, mandates in the new ACOP plan, you could be held as least non-compliant and could be open to eviction uh, or you know, getting um, taken out of the public housing program. So that is our real concern. We wanna make sure that folks are aware of all of these changes um, and, um, and we can find ways uh, to hopefully minimize it. There is a new director coming on board. Currently there's the uh, interim director, Dorian Jenkins, um, but um, as of um, 
yesterday's uh, Board of Commissioners meeting, we have learned that a gentleman um, named Pettigrew, and I'm forgetting his first name, Keith Pettigrew, who currently heads up the Alexandria Housing Authority, will be taking over here in November 1st as the new director of the Housing Authority. So we do have likely some opportunities to engage with him around some of the concerns and ACOT being one of them. Um, with that said, let me turn it over to Lori um, to walk us through. Uh, we have shared with you all a flyer that gives us all of the concerns um, that, that we have seen and this process was done by looking at this very long, long document uh, that's been updated. We had some of our leaders uh, here at Empower DC, public housing residents, review it. And we started to see what were the ones that concerned them most as public housing residents. So it's a mix of that and some of the stuff that um, we all as advocates and organizers also saw as very concerning. So with that said, let me pull that up and Lori will begin to walk us through that. Uh, this is not it. This is it. Um, hi everyone, it's so good to see, see you all and uh, some some familiar names and some unfamiliar names. Um, so I don't think Daniel mentioned, but just so you know who I am, um, I have been a housing attorney in DC for several years now um, and have been um, dealing with the housing authority in various ways going back, I think to 2000 and maybe 2006, maybe earlier, I can't remember. Um, and I have uh, in particular spent a lot of time over the past uh, six months or so working on these, or not working on, commenting on, advocating around, complaining about these new regulations um, and, and really trying to listen to uh, public housing residents about what your concerns are. Um, so, um, I'm going to start with just a question I've heard a lot is like, what's in effect? When is it in effect? Is it going to change? What is happening? Uh, which is a question that I get from my fellow attorneys almost as often as I get from um, public housing residents. So, um, the answer to that question is that the DC Housing Authority, um, officially has published these as regulations and is saying that they're in effect. Um, so if you wanted to be on the safe side, which I would be if my housing were on the line, um, I would assume that they are, these are all rules that you now have to follow. Um, with my lawyer for tenants hat on, I will say there are a lot of procedural problems with these and um, and many of them are not necessarily properly in effect. So if you get in trouble for breaking one of these new rules, um, there are some extra defenses for you because um, DCHA has messed up in their process of making these rules into official rules. So, so my overall message is the safest thing to do is to follow them because DCHA thinks they're in effect um, with a few exceptions, which we'll talk about as we get to them. Um, but if you should find yourself on the wrong side of any of them or your neighbors on the wrong side of any of them, um, there are there are things we can do. There are there are defenses, there are fights to have. So so just an overall uh, kind of murky area, but my my suggestion on how to handle that murky is. Um, I actually wanna, it's sort of lower down on the document, but Daniel, can you scroll to the grievance part? Um, 
So what I think is perhaps the most major change here is you now only have 30 days to file a grievance if um, DCHA does something that you don't like, if they um, calculate your rent and you disagree with the rent calculation, if they don't do an interim recertification, if they give you a notice of termination, if they you know, refuse to give you something that you're looking for, if they, you know, deny you a reasonable accommodation, um, all of these, and any adverse, any bad action that DCHA takes against you, you used to have a whole year to, um, to file an official grievance about it. Um, and now, under the new rules, you only have 30 days. Um, and it has been my experience over many years of dealing with DCHA that when DCHA sends notices, they don't often come immediately, right? Like when I get a letter dated September 1st from DCHA, it often doesn't arrive until like September 15th. So um, if you're getting notices from DCHA saying that you've done something wrong or making a decision you don't like, um, you really wanna get on top of filing a grievance immediately. Um, you know, Ideally you wanna contact a legal services attorney to help you, um, but the form is actually pretty simple. So if you can't get in touch with a legal services attorney on time, just file anything. Like I disagree with the letter you sent me on dated September 1st, period. Um, because there isn't a lot of time. Um, and then going back to what I started this meeting with, even if you think it's too late, it's been more than 30 days. We've all had that situation, right? Where you open that thing and you're like, I'm going to do that tomorrow. And then suddenly 17 other things happened and you didn't get to it and it's past the deadline. There are, again, arguments we have been making successfully. So just file the grievance anyway, even if you're at. So file it as soon as possible. But even if you think it's too late, file it in. Does that make sense? I can't see anyone, so I know if there's nodding. But if anything I say doesn't make sense, either unmute or put something in the chat. Um, okay, let's scroll back to the top, Daniel, please. Also, if anyone wants to show their faces so that I can see if I'm boring you to death or getting a, or your understanding, I would appreciate it. Um, thank you, friends. Okay, pets. Um, so officially, no one who lives on a non-elderly or disabled property is going to be allowed to have a pet. So if you think, if you were thinking ever that you wanted, so if you, but if you already have one, you're going to be allowed to keep it. And this goes into effect on January 1st. So if you thought that like you were thinking that maybe you wanted a dog or, or your kid was asking for a cat and you were like, well, maybe if you're really good, like it's, you want to get it now. Uh, because um, you're you're not allowed to get new pets after January first. If you live if you live on a if you live in an elderly or disabled only property, then you can get new pets. But if you live um, and where most of from the chat where most of you live, um, so right if you live at Garfield family, then no new pets after. January 1st. If you live at Garfield Senior, yes, new pets after January 1st. Um, they're going to, regardless of where you live, they're going to charge you up for your pets. Um, there's going to be a deposit and there's going to be a deposit for everyone. And then if you live in a family property or any non-elderly property, um, there's going to be a fee for each pet. Um, so just again, keep this in mind and, um, it's easy to get caught having a pet. So I just want to like really, uh, caution you all, you know, caution you all, especially, um, you know, 
four-legged pets that run around. Um, and the pet rules do include, so when they say no new pets, it's not just cats and dogs. Like if you ever thought you wanted a fish tank, like this is the moment to get a fish tank because you can't get a new fish tank in, in January. No new fish, no new frog, no new cats. Um, if people have specific, the rules about the pets are very specific. So if people have questions about that, we can we can talk about that more specifically. But the bottom line is, if you have, if you get a pet, if you have a pet or you get one before January, um, you can have up to two once January rolls around problems. Okay. Community service. Um, this is not in effect yet because DCHA has not trained their staff on how to implement it yet. So um, theoretically, the rules are in effect and theoretically, uh, once a year is the fee, not once a month. Good question. Um, and the deposit is only once. So the deposit is once and done for the whole life of your pet, which is hopefully, you know, long. Um, and the the additional fee is once a year. Um, community service. So starting at some point when DCHA says that it's starting, um, you will need to do um, officially eight hours of community service. Anybody, well, I should say, anyone who is not employed will need to do eight hours of community service a month. If you have a full-time job, you do not have to do the community service. But if you do not have a full-time job, um, unless you are over 62, have a disability, or the primary caregiver for someone with a disability, um, you're going to have to do eight hours of community service a month. It says eight hours a month. It's eight times 12 is 96. I was just practicing multiplication tables with my my fourth grader in my house. Um, you have to do 96 hours a year. They recommend you do eight hours a month. So you divide it up. But if you like wanna just like intensively volunteer for two weeks for some organization, that's that works. Um you're gonna have to fill out a form that they're gonna provide to you. Um, they haven't yet announced whether you can self-certify that you did it or they're gonna make your uh the the organization that you do service for, uh, you know, sign off that you did it. It can't be um, kind of political or advocacy work. It has to be um, more direct service kind of work. Um, but, you know, things like working in a community garden or volunteering with your kids. You know, if you're the volunteer coach for your kid's soccer team, um, and it's a, you know, YMCA team or something like that, um, that's going to count. If you're, you know, giving out food at a meal site, that's going to count. Um, so it's worth starting to think about if, if you are not someone who regularly does community service, it's worth starting to think about um, where and how you can get those hours done so that when DCHA starts uh giving out the documents and, and enforcing these rules, you'll be ready. They're also supposedly supposed to help you find places to do community service. We'll see if that happens. That's what I will say about that. Um, if you fall into one of the exemption categories, uh, you're, they will probably ask you to fill out an exemption form, um, which they haven't made yet, uh, or if they've made it, they haven't given it to the property managers yet. So stay tuned for more detailed information from them and hopefully um, empower. One, once we find out about it, we'll try to get the information out to you as well. Um, are we good on community service? Any questions about community service? Okay, guests. Um, so the, some of the guest rules are the same, but I want to emphasize them. Oh, Miss Simmons, did you have something to say? I just saw you on. Yes, I, I. Who signs off on the community service for people? Who mainly signs off on them? So, 
DCHA can make you get the organization that you do community service with to sign off, but they can also let you self-certify and they haven't announced which choice they're making. Oh, okay. Um, it's one of these really clearly written regulations. It's like, we'll either do A or B or maybe C. Um, we'll tell you. Um, but I did, I was at a, I, I did specifically ask at a meeting, they haven't trained their staff on how to implement it yet. So they therefore are not implementing it yet. Okay, that's fine. Um, guests. I think you guys all know this because this has been true for a, yes, you can volunteer at a school classroom, volunteering at your kid's school or a not your kid's school, um, will count as community service. Um, so I think you guys already know you're responsible for your guests' behavior. So, you know, you want to be careful about that. The big deal. So the limits are a guest can't stay for more than 10 days in a row or 30 total days over the course of a year. Um, the big, new, annoying, but maybe some people like it, thing is if you have an overnight guest staying for more than three days, which they're allowed to do, right? You can have your grandchild from North Carolina is allowed to come and stay with you for a week. But if they are planning on staying for more than three days, you have to let your property manager know. You have to notify DCHA that the guest will be staying for more than three days. Um, they are allowed to, you have to let them know. Um, if you need to have a guest stay for more than 10 days in a row, um, there is, you can ask for an exception, an exemption. Um, you have to have a good reason. Um, so, you know, if you have a family member or friend require, uh, recovering from some kind of medical procedure, um, you know, I think, or if you have a child or grandchild who, you know, doesn't normally live with you, who needs to stay with you for two weeks or a month. Um, I will add here, um, foster children and foster adults, DCHA is supposed to add them to your lease. So if for whatever reason you need or want to take in a foster child, um, DCHA, you you can't you can they can move in right away, um, and then you have to fill out a piece of paper. But DCHA will approve them, so they won't count as a guest. Um, former residents who have been evicted for any reason, including non-payment of rent. So if someone, you know, you live at Kenilworth, someone else who used to live at Kenilworth was evicted at some point, they are not, according to the way the regulations are written right now, they're not allowed to, to stay overnight in your home. Um, DCHA did say they meant they don't want them staying there long term, and they have suggested that they might change those regulations in response to our feedback, but um, the way they are written now and what is in effect right now and what they can hold you responsible for right now is if someone has ever been evicted from your property for any reason, they cannot stay overnight. So you want to be careful of that. Um, Daniel, are you available to scroll or I can... Any questions about guests? Um, so just on recertification stuff, I'm gonna say two things about that. One is DCHA has made the rules about recertification um, more onerous, more more burdensome than they were before, um, require more documents. And also 
HUD, the federal government came out with new rules that make recertification easier across the country that go into effect on January 1st. And DCHA did say in their July meeting that they're gonna rewrite the rules all about that uh, to, to be in compliance with the new federal rules that go into effect January 1st. So all I'm gonna say about recertification is it's gonna look a lot different starting in January and we're not sure how yet. So stay stay tuned. Um, criminal background checks. Um, even though HUD does not recommend such things, BCHA has decided that they're gonna run um, a criminal background check every, um, every time you do a recertification. Um, and I think this says at recertification, I think DCHA has said that they're gonna um, run a sex offender, a check on the lifetime sex offender registration list actually annually, even though you only recertify every two or three years. Um, but we will see what they actually end up doing. But they are DCHA um, kind of going against what the DC government is moving towards and against what the national trends are um, is gonna be really very focused on criminal activity and criminal background checks um, and looking at arrests in a way that would be illegal for tenants in private housing in DC. So just flagging, you know, pros and cons to that, but just flagging that, um, that DCHA is is very is extra specially concerned about um, criminal activity of any kind right now. Um, on any questions about any of that, anything else I've said so far? Okay. Income calculation. Again, there are some new federal rules that are going to change, but something that is important. And actually this is coming up for a lot of people right now. Um, this is not my area, but you know, I work with low-income people in DC and everything's connected. I'm seeing a lot of people have problems lately with their benefits, with their TANF and their food stamps and things like this. Um, so um, if you're getting unemployment insurance, if you're getting TANF, if something happens, and your payments are delayed or they're cut off improperly, and then you get them restored. If DCHA has reduced your, you know, if you contact DCHA and say, I have no income, and then you get a payment for a few months back for TANF or unemployment insurance, DCHA is saying, you're going to owe back rent for the, you know, I didn't get unemployment for three months and then I got a three month chunk of unemployment and my rent was zero because I didn't have any income. DCHA is going to come back and say, well, we're actually going to charge you rent for those three months. I have questions about the legality of DCHA doing that. And it might be a thing you want to fight if it comes to pass to you, but also just, I, the reason I'm saying it now is if that's a thing that's happening, just be aware that you may have a debt you have to pay with that. Like you may owe back rent with that money. So um, if you're getting a lump sum of unemployment insurance of TANF, um, don't, don't go and spend it all until you have worked out with DCHA whether DCHA is going to um, increase your rent going backwards. Um, does all right, late payment of rent. Sorry, I'm being a little long winded, I'm realizing. Um, if you don't pay your rent by the 10th of the month, DCHA will charge a late fee, 5% or $50. Um, this is true even if the 10th of the month is a weekend or a holiday. So the theory is, right, your rent is due 
the first of the month and they're giving you until the 10th before they pay, they charge you a late fee. So even if, um, you know, the, the 10th of the month is, well, it wouldn't be, but like a holla three day holiday weekend and the 10th is the Monday, like you're still, you're still going to get charged the late fee. You got to pay it by Friday. Um, I was trying to think of a holiday weekend that could be the 10th of the month. I don't know if there is one. President's Day, maybe? President's Day, but it could be the 10th. So let's say President's Day falls on the 10th. You got you to pay by Friday. Um, they also increase the fees for return check fees. So just want to be careful about those things. And DCHA seems very interested in keeping on top of their eviction process. Um, what if you're waiting for rent and sometimes they are sent out like that is a great question um, I don't know what DCHA will do um, they they seem very intent on on being as strict as possible both with admitting new people to the program and on um, grounds for eviction. This is not on the flyer, but I do wanna raise this. Um, these aren't really changes so much as like that are concrete for you all, but there are a number of grounds, you know, reasons that you could be evicted from public housing, um, but there are fewer than the reasons you could be evicted from privately owned housing. And in the past, the, the DCHA regulations said for most of them, DCHA may evict you if you do X, Y, or Z thing. Um, they have changed all the mays to shalls or wills. Um, DCHA is really trying to be as, as stringent as they can with regard both to reasons to deny people to get into public housing or to get vouchers. Uh, I know we're not talking about vouchers, but um, but some of you may be applying for vouchers, so I'm flagging it. Um, DCHA is is trying to make it as, as strict and as stringent as possible. Anything that HUD allows them to deny people for, they have decided to exercise that option. And the same thing with, with eviction or termination that anything that HUD said, you may decide to evict people for the, this reason. DCHA has said, we will evict people for that reason. Um, again, I don't, you know, new leadership is coming in. I don't know exactly how it's gonna play out, but the way they have written these rules is to be as strict and as stringent as possible. Um, and, you know, I've just spent, you know, a half hour talking at you. Sorry, I don't like to talk at people for that long at one time about these changes. Um, there are, I think it's 256 pages of changes to the regulations for public housing. Um, DCHA staff, insofar as they let people know about them, gave people a 14 slide PowerPoint. So the reason you're like, why am I finding this out from Lori and Daniel? And who the heck is Lori anyway? And not from my property manager of folks at DCHA, I don't know. But like what you heard, if you did hear was this 14 slide PowerPoint, which also talked about the changes to the voucher program, which is another 400 pages of changes. Um, so, Um, so to one question I see in the chat, I think somebody else gave, gave an answer, uh, DCHA has a responsibility for getting those statements out on the 10th. Yeah. So this is a larger issue about them getting out late. Um, but the question about when does this take effect? It all takes effect now, except apparently the community service didn't because DCHA doesn't have their act together. So theoretically, you have to follow all of these new rules now. Um, and they were theoretically in effect going back to April 12th. Um, 
And if you think the process seems not like what the correct process should be, you would be correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is part of what has concerned us and why we're out there trying as much as possible to re let residents know. Because as Lori mentioned, this is like 256 pages, right? And we were able to comb through and identify as I, we mentioned, the ones that we thought were the, the most egregious, right? The ones that really jumped out at us. But I have put in the in the in the chat the link to the DC regulations. So these, as I understand it, are existing as emergency. Um, they once again introduced them as emergency. They should finalize all of these by the beginning of next year. Like it should be their new and constant housing policy. Um, I do think that there is a lot of opportunity for us to continue pushing on some of these things um, that we are concerned on. Uh, but before I we get to that, I just wanted to see if there's any other questions, any comments that folks may have around um, what we've just heard. And if not, that's fine. You know, it, it's a lot to digest. It's a lot to think about. Um, I, I want to let you all know that we want to be a resource for you all. I see a Somebody. couple of... President, ooh, is there somebody? Somebody had a question in the chat. Oh. Um, you should be getting a new lease. And also theoretically, some of these rules are things that have to be in a lease in order to apply to you. Again, DCHA doesn't see it that way, but the federal regulations see it that way. Um, so at some point you are gonna need a new lease or DCHA is gonna have a hard time enforcing these rules because there are too many housing lawyers in DC and what is DCHA going to do if they're not following the rules for anybody? Um, we're going we're gonna to have, have a lot of work to do. So you should be getting new leases at some point. I suspect not until 2024. Um, and all of much of this information should be in your news. And I will add, I, I wrote for Daniel. And when Daniel made that flyer, I wrote Daniel, I think, a 15-page document with a list of all the changes that affect public housing tenants, uh, which which he he was able to to condense into that smaller version. But there are, you know, these are the most important major things that affect you all. But there are there are there's a 15 page list of of changes that that affect you, and 256 pages of all the changes. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is quite a bit. Um... As, as many of you know, and how we've met you, although I know some of you all, um, is through the outreach we've been doing at each property. So I've been checking in with resident council presidents, making sure it's okay to go out on the property, knocking on each door, uh, leaving the flyer, um, leaving the flyer at each person's uh, door, and then if you are a resident council president, if you are just a resident leader on your property and you'd like to have a meeting uh, to discuss this, uh, it, you know, for your uh, for your um, community, for your property, please feel free to reach out to me. I will put my name and you, you should all have that in the emails that I sent, but I'll drop it in the chat again, um, because this is just how serious we think it is. And I'll I'll underscore what Lori is saying, you know, like they are trying to make it the hardest to get into public housing and the hardest to stay in public housing. That's the way we see it, um, because they, you know, HUD, you know, we were able initially when this started, they literally went from zero to 50. Right. And as far as minimum rent, they wanted to charge fifty dollars for minimum rent when HUD allows them to do anything between zero and 50. So they just went for the highest off the bat. So this is 
what we feel they are applying to all of these policies where they're going with the most stringent uh, end of it. And, you know, we want to make sure that people aren't evicted uh, for, um, I don't want to say nonsense, but for, um, you know, these rules that really don't make a lot of sense to, to many of us who want to ensure that people stay housed, because that's the other problem is what happens to you if you do lose your place in the public housing uh, program? You have to, you know, you you can't transfer to another public housing property. You will likely not be able to get a voucher. Um, so these are the bigger issues that we are concerned about and why we want to make sure that we really are uh, staying on top of this, uh, making sure that um, we are able to let as many residents know about it. So once again, if um, if you want us to hit your property, if you want to have a meeting on your property, please feel free to reach out to 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 me, um, Mr. Kenneth. Go right ahead. You have a question or comment? Good evening, everyone. I think it's a shame that uh, I'm a former commissioner. For some of you all don't know, but within the last past nine months that I've been gone. They still have not shown receipts for the sale of the 1133 building. Um, on top of that, they did not do the due diligence process of this letter that they're sending out to people now trying to convince the public housing residents to accept a voucher. Um, I feel that it is a trick way of getting people to take a voucher. Um, there's certain components that you give a person or prepare a person to be, be to become prepared readiness to take something for them to take a voucher over knowing what that means. They're no longer on a pH portfolio. Some people's rent, literally their utilities will start. They don't know anything about that. We've been blessed to have all included there are some amenities that we pay, like it's seven dollars for maybe um, an extra um, air conditioner, or twelve dollars for an extra freezer. But those are those are small costs as opposed to what you're getting ready to put yourself into by taking a voucher, and they don't understand it. And I think it's wrong for it not to be explained earnest and honestly to them, if you don't have a job or a career, to me, a voucher is not for you. If you have not gone through financial literacy and you've learned yourself along with who's in your household to turn off a television, not to run the water, your utilities can go as high as your rent monthly then you don't have any subsidies. Some of the agency, even as far as the mayor ran out of money. To pay. So, you know, these are things that if you all could add to your advocacy to bring to light, I'm trying my best, but it seems like that you all are getting a larger feedback and responses, as well as the young lady, I believe, uh, Can I Live? You are the only two organizations that I know that have been forthcoming and fair and clear in what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Council. Yes. Um, and we want to continue to do that. You know, I think one clear avenue to raise up these concerns are the monthly Board of Commissioners meetings, which on the flyer we have listed. They are the second Wednesday of every month at 1 p.m. And, you know, I don't think it would be out of line for anyone here to register to, uh, you know, raise up your concerns. They'll say, well, we've been through the process and so on and so forth. But I think they need to hear it more and more because, as was mentioned a little earlier, you know, they presented a very short PowerPoint presentation uh, I know every single resident has not seen this. Um, so yes, I will uh, I'll forward you the flyer, uh, Miss Moon, uh, in just a minute. Um, but yeah, once again, please know that we are here to be a resource. And uh, Lori, I think you wanted to bring a couple of things up. 
Yeah. Um, Mr. Council reminded me of two other changes that didn't make on the flyer, but I think I just want to flag for folks. One is they've left the door open. This change isn't happening right now, but they've left the door open to start charging separately for utilities. Um, so just be careful, be on the lookout. This is, this is a good time to be extra reading everything. Um, and then two is um, another change is they're, is they're, at, they're requiring you to report changes in your income um, within 30 days. So that's actually a big change. Um, it used to, I can't remember, I, it was a lot, kind of a lot of money. I think it was over $5,000. You didn't have to report changes between research unless it was it, your income increased by, by $5,000 or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But now it's any change in your income you're supposed to report within 30 days. So just be, you know, I'm wishing for you all raises in the next, in the upcoming months. So when you all get your raises in the next, in the upcoming months, um, make sure to report them to DCHA because that's, that's another change that they've put in. That is a big deal. The other thing, I'm going to put an email in the chat. If you have, um, if you have feedback for DCJ, if you're angry about any of these changes, or if you, um, or if you want to change that that we didn't say, um, you can send an email to publication comments at dchousing.org saying, you know, whatever it is that you, you know, I think I should be able to have guests for more than 10 days. I think, uh, the recertification rules should go back to how they used to be. Whatever changes, whatever changes you'd like, and this is the they're rewriting literally all of their rules and regulations. So if there's any rule or regulation that you wished for or wished would not happen, um, this is the time. Um, they've reopened for comments uh, until the beginning of I can't remember the lot the exact date of the deadline, but. I think October 7th, maybe. So um, so you you absolutely can, uh, and they are required by law to consider, I'm making air quotes for those of you who are just on the phone, uh, consider in some in some way comments that you make um during this time period. So um in addition to showing up at meetings, which you should definitely do, um, because then the board sees your hears your comments in addition to just staff. But um, but you have the, you still have the opportunity to they're still revising these. You still have the opportunity to make your voice heard. And I apologize. I was sending uh, folks uh, the flyers. Um, there's a question in the chat. What if you have submitted your income changes? but have not received any correspondence indicating your new rental amount. Generally, how long does it take for them to respond? <sighs> that unfortunately is, a it's a great question and one that I'm not sure I have the answer to. I mean, it's an issue that I hear that people will update them and it takes, you know, an uncertain amount of time uh, to get the response. Um, do you find that to be I, true, Lori? Yeah, I mean, I'm curious if other folks here who have personal experience may be may have better thoughts than I do. But I will say, if your rent is going up, they they have to give you 30 days notice of your rent going up. So if it takes them six months, then that's six months where your rent didn't go up. Um, if your rent is going down, the decrease will be retroactive to the first of the month after you submit it. So if you submit it today, your rent goes down as of October 1st, even if they take until July to get back to you. I know there are problems with how do you pay your rent between now and July while they're dealing with it. But just from a from a legal perspective, that's what the rules are. Yeah, if it's supposed to go up, then that's DCHA's problem. Yeah, um, 
So once again, you know, I think we can be a resource uh, to trying to connect. Like I just recently had somebody call me who said she wasn't a senior, but she was a retired police officer. And she wanted to know how to get that exemption from the volunteer um, mandate. Um, so we were able to get her connected to a couple of folks at the housing authority, uh, namely Wayne Waller, who's, um, oh God, what is his title? He is the ombudsman, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so if if we can be of any help in, in, in getting answers uh, like this, please feel free to reach out. Um, you all should have my email, daniel at empowerdc.org, and my phone number uh, is 202-731-8634. I will put that in the chat. Um, so, you know, as as we as we continue, I, some next steps, as I mentioned, that I think will be important, and I'll just repeat again, um, is joining those monthly board of commissioners meetings, which can be timely, which can be frustrating because they've taken this new approach where they say, we're going to listen to the residents first. And they put your testimony up front and they give you three minutes to speak, but they do very little in responding to your, to your questions um, or your concerns. That's been my opinion as I attend all of these meetings. Nonetheless, I do think it's important because there is, um, it creates a public record. Um, the press is able to see it. Um, I got, I was just surprised and not to pat myself on the back, but I, I was quoted on some testimony that I gave recently in a, in, uh, at, at the last board of commissioner meeting. So I say that to say that other people are listening, right? The media is listening. Other folks are watching. Um, so it's important for us to use that avenue to be able to lift up these concerns and questions that we have. Uh, and we can push them to, um, to, to give us answers, written answers. Uh, that's what I hope to do with the folks that we helped to register and testify at the, at the recent hearing. So um, be on the lookout for that. I send monthly updates um, that, you know, just update folks on what's happening. Um, and I make sure to include that, you know, it, I send them before the, the board of commissioners meeting. So if you need help registering, if you need help developing testimony, uh, you know, always feel free to reach out. As I mentioned, if you would like us to come to your property specifically to talk about these issues, I don't know if I'll be able to drag Lori with me, but we can certainly, uh, um, I'm draggable. <laughs> <laughs> we can certainly, uh, you know, uh, this will be recorded. You'll be able to share it with your community. Um, but, you know, the more that um, we all know, the better we can share what the concerns and what we've heard uh, is out there. So um, feel free to do that. If we've not hit your property yet, uh, doing outreach, the door to door outreach, please let me know. We're always willing and able to do that. Um we, we tend to do outreach at public housing properties at least once a week. Um, so please uh, feel free to let me know if you have that uh, need. And then in general, you know, we, our goal is to help organize public housing residents around the issues that matter to them. So if you are faced with a redevelopment, if you are faced with, um, you know, a demolition, if you're faced with any of these type of issues, um, we could certainly help as much as we have the capacity to help. We've been through quite a bit, uh, you know, in, in working around these issues. Um, that's not to say that we know everything, but we certainly um, uh, have a, a lot of experience and we want to support your, uh, you know, your knowledge, your, your lived experience, because we know you all know what the problems are and likely know all the solutions. Uh, I think it's a matter of getting organized, amplifying your voices, um, and, and being able to use, um, you know, some of the avenues such as the Board of Commissioners, any council hearings that are coming up, you know, as we wrap up the year, we got to get ready for these uh, oversight hearings, which will be important for us to say, how did we think, you know, the Housing Authority 
uh, did this past year. So we'll be ramping up for that for the budget season. Um, so please, um, you know, if there's any need uh, around organizing on your property, even if that's to, you know, help me uh, figure out how to put to, how to strengthen my resident council, uh, please feel free to reach out. And I'm just going to emphasize every, like whenever we as like professional advocates testify, they're like, well, we only care what the residents have to say. And we don't believe you when you tell us what the residents are telling you. So the more you all can join together and and speak out, the, the more we can make changes happen for you. Because people people are much more concerned about what, what you have to say than what we have to say. And also, as I mentioned, you know, there is the new director coming on board. As we understand, he's a DC native. He grew up in Berry Farm. Uh, so he's a local guy. Um, so I think it'll be important for residents to get in front of him, uh, you know, put forth some of your concerns, your questions, your suggestions for improving the housing authority. So we'll see either what avenues the housing authority creates to meet with a new director, or we can certainly try to create them. Um, so yeah, I think that's another option for us um, to, to move forward around uh, these issues. I wanna be mindful of the time. I, we've spent an hour together so far, which I think is great. Um, and and I don't necessarily want to end early, but I want to check in to see if there's any other questions or comments or clarifications that you all may have. Um, I did put my name and my email and my phone number in the chat, so please feel free to re reach out. But please, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Simmons. I have a question. I'm saying, can, when is the time you can look at your folder, your file? Can you go? You can't go in the management office and ask for it, can you? Or you have to go to 1133. To know what's in your file, like every two years or so. I have I've been on this property twenty years. I've never asked to see a file, so I want to know where do where do you go? That is a good question because I've I've heard from several residents that I work with that you know such a thing, certain things weren't in their in their files right. and so on and so forth. I, I at this point in time I don't have the answer, but I'm, I am taking down uh, notes on, on on what we need to follow up. Um, yeah, I mean you're legally though. entitled to your file, but mm -hmm. I don't know. And I think they're all. I mean I think they're all electronic now, not. But I would paper. think if something go in your file, they would send you a message or give you some kind of clue or something going in yeah. your file. They're supposed so. to be starting a portal, but I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, but I would also add, um, as far as I know, 1133 is no more, and they have a new customer service center near the Lamphont Plaza Metro. I think oh, no. the address is 307th Street Southwest. Okay. But it's it's like right near for those folks that take metro, it's it's right near the Lafont Plaza. It's like between two of the metro entrances. And it's the metro building. This was confusing to me when I went. All the signage says metro. They have like part of the metro building. All right. Yeah. Three hundred seventh street southwest. Okay. Is what it is. And um we'll make sure to send that as a follow up email. Um, with some of the, the the things we heard today. I'll make sure to send everyone um, that attended and just in general an email with all of these details. Okay. Thanks. Alrighty, folks. Well, unless there's any other questions, um, you know, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to meet with us today. Well, Miss um, Edwards has a question. Well, Miss Edwards, go right ahead. Uh, or whoever just typed in the chat that you have a question. I think that's Miss Edwards. Miss Edwards, I'm asking you to unmute if you can. Um, 
I know you know how to reach me too. So if you need to follow up with me, uh, feel free to give me a call. Oh, uh, uh, this is Mr. Edwards and Sussman. I am. Um, I have a question about. Um, so our balance on the rent is a bunch of amount, and the we have an email that said that we were um, uh, the rent was paid. We they said the rent was paid, but in the rent cafe, it's the balance is still showing that the rent was not paid. So how do we um, go about getting that resolved? Yeah, let me follow up with you, um, Mr. Kellum, around around that issue. Um, usually we have some success when we reach out to the ombudsman. He can get us the right people. Um, so I will give you a call tomorrow morning uh, to get more details, and then we can reach out to them to hopefully get that um, straightened out. Sounds great. Okay, wonderful. I'm just making a note of it. All right. All right, folks. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us uh, with any question, any follow up, any need for support uh, for yourself or your property. Um, you know, and once again, our goal is to to get organized and to push back against these issues uh, as much as we can uh, in order to improve the quality of life uh, for public housing residents. So public housing residents have more of a say with what happens in their life. So thank you all for attending this evening. Um, please feel free to reach out with anything. Let me thank Lori so much for taking the time to join us and help us uh, understand uh, these changes a bit better. Um, and we'll just keep, keep, keep pushing. Thank you, finish. Daniel and Lori. It's been very informative. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you all. All righty. Well, have a great evening. Have a great weekend. And we will be in contact soon. All righty. Bye, everyone. Bye.